So I really loved the idea of understanding behavior. And I ended up in this field by accident. I was actually studying economics. And um, well, basically, um, after I did a lot of math, I d realized that I really wanted to apply that math to understanding human behavior. And then I bumped into psychology and I said, oh, this is interesting. And uh, I started working on that. And then, basically, um, I worked on understanding more or less emotions. And then I met Charles Spence and said, oh, this sensory stuff is awesome. I want to work on this. I want to understand the relationship between the two. So today, I want to talk about why I think the world is inside our brain. That is very constant compared to the world that comes into our brain. We live in a world of physical and chemical constants that is actually very accurate compared to what comes in here. It's still very good. Evolution has done a, a very good job, but it's not perfect. And so, we live in, a, in an uncertain system. That's, that's why sensory integration, which is a big topic today, is so important. That's why the brain has to add up, get friends, talk, communicate, and try to get a better, a better idea of this world. So I don't work alone. I work with a team of people. So I work with Charles Michel, who's a French Colombian chef, who does amazing and crazy food, and just basically applies neuroscience-inspired methods to create his food. And then we do research on it with him, to see, not of him sometimes, but no, generally of the food. And with Carlos, who's my other colleague, who basically is another uh, experimental psychologist. So we basically work together, trying to understand through basics, th through everyday things like food or uh, film or that sort of thing, how the brain works and how senses communicate to each other. So this is a picture of a condor in the Nazca Lines in Peru, which is a place I really love and that really shocked me when I went there. And so I think that the brain, and especially studying the senses, is a lot like the Nazca Lines. They were discovered by accident, and you have to look at, them, look at them from a distance to actually get an idea of what's going on. You have to go there, you have to go up in an airplane and see, wow, these 140 square meter lines that look like birds and monkeys and spiders are there, and you think, why do they do that? What's, what's there? And you can't see them if you walk around on that desert. You have to go up in the plane and say, oh, there's something there. So with the brain, it's the same thing. If you're walking around, you might think your experience is through your senses, and you might get a theory on it. You say, oh, when I bite a burger, I get that taste on it, and say, oh, this works. This is good, right? But the way it actually works, we have to step a bit out and say, oh, there's a lot to it. So that's also what I'm going to talk about today. So if you see this photo of the Christchurch Meadow, it's, it's a bit weird, right? Psychedelic, it's a bit changing color. So if you think about the colors that are moving there, and I asked you, well, what sort of flavors would you think those clouds uh, have, right? You say, okay, this guy's crazy. I'm not arguing there, but uh, basically, what, what flavors do you think, if the color pink, is it, is it sweet or is it sour, right? You say, well, maybe it's sweet, right? And, and would something green or yellow, would it be sm more sour than something pink? You'd say, well, maybe, yeah. And a lot of, a lot of us will agree. Most of us will agree. So th that's what I work on. That's what Charles Michel, who's sitting in row 34E there, I know where you are, so don't try anything crazy, is, is working on as well. What we're trying to understand is how we can connect a color or a flavor or a smell or even a texture to each other. What's going on there? So we do have a, a very powerful, interesting sensory brain. We have a brain that is connected to many senses, and that talks to them, and they talk to it. So that's why I think that the world is inside of us. Because the world out there, the perfect, awesomely constructed, physical, chemical world out there, cannot be experienced perfectly by our brain. So he compensates. One of the ways he compensates is by gambling. Yes. How does it gamble? It goes and says, I think that must be red, more or less. So he says, it might not be exactly red, but we're going to say it's red and see how good it, it works. Sometimes we make mistakes, so the brain compensates for that, for that next time, right? But the world is much more complex than that. 
So it's not only about what color it is, but then the brain says, okay, that's going to taste really good. How do you know? Oh, because last time we had a, a, an ice cream of that color that smelled like that, that was as heavy as that, in that sort of packaging, oh, that was great. So that's, that sounds really good. So what the brain does to reduce noise, to reduce interference, is to say, okay, I'm going to use my smell and my vision and maybe even my touch or the temperature to get all that data to make sure that my prediction is better than just one sense. So that how, that's how it works. So really, every time you're out there in the world tasting something, kissing someone, or doing lots of other stuff, your brain is trying to integrate as many of the, of the senses possible to make it a wonderful experience and to understand the experience. Because in the end, a good experience is an experience that the brain can understand. The other thing it does, as I was saying, is to measure pleasure and pain. We have to know we're screwing up, basically. So it's easy with basic things, like if you're cutting with scissors and you don't notice you're cutting your finger, your brain will tell you, don't cut that, it's not good. A little bit to the right, right? Hopefully. But again, with more complex things, it's not so easy. Right? So if you're in love, how do you, how do you explain that? That's so complicated. Right? And then why do you prefer one product over another? Or why do you like that flavor instead of the other? How does that work? So the brain's measuring how much reward something gives you. And it's storing it and saying, well, okay, next time we're going to take this information into account when we go gambling in the casino. Because we know that red pays well. Right? And actually, red pays so well, so I'm stepping in a re bi really big red dot here, right? And Ted has a red color. And red has been shown to bias our cognition. It can, can, it can alter how good you are in math when you're taking a test. Actually, it makes you worse, so don't wear red. And it can also alter how much strength, motor output you get when you're running, for example. So it's, how, it's really crazy how just Random things or simple things like colors or smells can actually enhance our lives and change how our brain thinks the world is and, or can be. So let's, let's, let's talk about food. And I think that after I talk a little bit more, you'll all get hungry, and I'm sorry about that. But, uh, well, maybe you can all go out and taste food in a different way. So which chocolate looks more bitter? The one on my right or the one on my left? Which one is it more bitter? So he's saying, that one, that one there, that one there, that looks much more bitter, right? But it's the same picture I took. It's exactly the same one. But something happened, right? So I went into Photoshop, I tweaked it a bit, and then we say, okay, that one's more bitter. What's going on there? Why can we say just by the change in lightning and brightness that that chocolate looks more bitter? All because our senses are getting connected to each other. They're communicating. So our brain never works alone. So basically, these guys are called Buban Kiki. Some of you might know about them. But the awesome thing about Buban Kiki is that they're actually shapes that, ga that have a lot of meaning. Basically, we know that one of them is Buba and the other one is Kiki. And these shapes are matched to certain flavors, certain smells, even certain uh, texture experiences. And everything we work on is based on this idea that the brain is cor has a correspondence in another sense. Now we get this. So that sound is a very low pitch, very strong sound, right? So if you eat chocolate with that sound, you'll get an even more bit of chocolate than if you eat it with this sound. Why does that happen again? Basically, because the, the way we think the world works might not be the way the world works. So, because we're walking through that crazy Nazca desert, we can't see the lines, so we can't really tell what's there. So everything just looks like rock, 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 dirt, right? Random tree thing that survived the desert. So, that's, 
that's basically what happens. So you say, when you ask someone, oh, what does that taste like? You say, oh, it tastes bitter, sour, whatever. But are you thinking, oh, when they are asking me taste, are they asking me smell and flavor? Just flavor, just smell. Are they asking me about the texture of the product? Are they asking me about the temperature of the product? Are they asking me about how the color of the product influences the way I decide what it tastes like in a non-conscious way, of course. So in the end, if we understand this better, we can actually enjoy our lives better. So if you're thinking about a beautiful boy or girl, and you want to say, oh, wait, wait, I want to cook something awesome and surprise them. So we don't have to be awesome chefs like Charles Michel to actually cook an interesting dinner. We have to combine the senses properly. So it's not about more, it's about better. Thinking about what, how can I enhance sweetness with high-pitched sounds or bitterness with low-pitched sounds. So would a, would, a, would, a Brit would, would a British beer taste better with low-pitched music or high-pitched music? Why are British beers warmer than Belgian beers? Is it just because it's British pride or is it because it's actually, there's, a no, a, there's a logic behind it? We say, oh, it's because maybe it helps in some way to enhance the flavor of the beer here. So that those are the questions we could ask to create a much better experience in our lives. Just to why and what is influencing us. So where in the brain is taste? What is taste? Because we thought taste was just, you take a bite and say, oh, it tastes like this is the flavor, right? Chocolate, strawberry, animal sweat, as in the Bordeaux wines. I'm not inventing it, they invented it. <laughs> so where in the brain is taste? And you think, well, Maybe I thought it was in the tongue, but now, hmm, somewhere else. So the way we thought about this, and the way we try to, to, to answer this is, taste is, and has been classically thought about as just flavor and smell. But we think it's everywhere. We think taste could be just part of what we see, part of what we touch, the weight of a dish, right? The sparkling of the champagne, all of that is part of taste. Could be part of the experience. So maybe we have more than five senses. We can even have 21. So we said, well, does it work everywhere? So he said, hey, why don't we go to Colombia, where I'm from? Charles actually said, Charles Spence said, hmm, you're there, you two crazy guys, just go. Check, check if the UK people work the same, same as the Colombian people in terms of how they experience things. So we said, let's go try something really crazy, not just anything. So he said, okay, let's get some Colombian fruits. Some really crazy Colombian fruits, and some of them not so crazy. So we get one, the, 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 the round one there is called lulo, right? The next one is guanabana, which is soursop. Then we have the pineapple, que es piña, right? Then we get passion fruit, maracuja, and then we get feijoa, which I have no idea how to say in English. <laughs> Tried, asked, no one knows. So basically, we took those fruits. So Charles was coming back and forth with, in, with a bag full of pops, going through customs here, and they were like, what is it again that you're doing with these things? And what are they? And what's a feijoa? So he's trying to explain to everyone here, like, look, this is, this is just fruit, you know? And they're like, can't be fruit. That, that's too weird. So we gave it to them, blindfolded, and they started testing them, and we asked them how booba or kiki they were. So they answered how booba and kiki they were. And they were always asking, seriously, is that an actual experiment? We're like, yes, yes. It's all good. It's all good. We're, we're serious. We're serious scientists. So... We, we got this, but what was awesome wasn't that they actually could say Buban or Kiki, but that the Colombians who knew the fruits and the UK citizens who didn't know what they were tasting and were feared that, afraid that we were going to poison them, actually said the exact same Buba or Kiki. So he said, oh, this is awesome. So maybe with all the marketing going crazy, trying to communicate across borders, cross-culturally, we could think of something more simple than trying to create a huge marketing campaign about how I convince you to buy the product regardless if you like the taste or not, or if the packaging is funky and weird, and you don't even know what it says because it's in another language. Maybe I could actually design something, thinking of a shape that looks like Buba for the sour salt and a shape that looks like Kiki for the Lulu. So when someone here tastes that, they'll say, oh, I already knew it's sour, because for some reason that shapes makes me think of something sour. So it, it can actually change the way we eat. It can actually help us design food that is healthier and that is tastier. So it's always the, oh, the kids don't like the vegetables. 
well, why not? And now we have a, a big issue, as, as we were talking with Sean Michelle before, was, oh, now we need to eat insects because they're easy to grow. And there's a lot of them, it seems. So how do we get Western people to eat insects? That's what he's asking now. That's what, he, what he's working on. That's what he's, he's thinking about saying. How do we get sensory science to convince all of us that grasshoppers are tasty and crunchy, delicious things, and we don't have to cover them in chocolate to get everyone to taste them, or just peel the chocolate off and eat the chocolate and say, oh, I really like grasshopper chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he's thinking about, and it's awesome to think that this can help change that. And there's already companies doing it, either empirically or by design, saying, oh, I know stars and pointy triangles talk about sparkling or bitter. And I know that the happy ease in Heineken make it a little bit sweeter. So I tell them, it's bitter, but not that bitter. It's a bit heavy, but not that heavy. It's a bit light too. So our brains are saying, oh, it's cool. And no wonder Heineken has won the prize of being the most productive company in the Netherlands twice, I think. It, it's not all about design and sensory science. Of course, there's hard work behind it. But Really, that makes you think, hmm, maybe a bit of design and a bit of neuroscience can really change things for the better if we know how to steer it. And so we got a little bit crazy and we said, oh, maybe. How about shape? Oh, and yeah. Shape also changes the way we look at things, but also changes how much, how sweet or sour or bitter something is. So we get a product and we get sound and we get color and we get texture and we get weight. And we get shape and we get temperature. All these things from just the packaging. We haven't even opened the product. We haven't even tasted it. It's crazy. So next time you go around and say, oh, maybe I'm just going to eat this. Imagine how many things are involved. Imagine how many crazy things are happening in your brains. And we're just walking through the desert. And we don't even know what's going on in there. So last thing I'm going to talk about. Are you hungry for a Kandinsky? So again... Charles Michel and Carlos said, oh, why don't we go and go crazy on this and say, let's do be a, build a dish that looks like a Kandinsky. And guess what? If you have a dish that looks like a Kandinsky, people like it more, even if they have the same ingredient, then it looks something plain and simple and normal. Why? Oh, the design in it, the balance in it. So basically, the best way to create and discover is to play with the senses. Thank you.